Wakandan stand up. Welcome all. My friends, this is a safe space. This is a war cry for muted rage, a drum beat on the rhythm of lost DNA, a black space in a void of facts. We are the igniting flame that will burn, baby burn. We are Wakandans. And this is the Wakandan Report, brought to you by the Stay Woke Podcast. Remember, you can't be woke if you don't stay woke. In 1977, millions of African Americans sat glued to the TV screens to watch the televised narrative of Alex Haley's novel, Roots. Roots began with the story on the continent of Africa, then took us through the middle passage of slavery and culminated with the realization of emancipation. This was a watershed moment in the narrative of black folks. It's since been reproduced, studied, analyzed, and become an unshakable staple when discussing black history. However, on February 16th of 2017, the world will be introduced to a fictional country that has the hopes of inspiring a living generation. Wakanda, oddly enough, is a creation of two white men, Living legend, Marvel Comics writer Stan Lee, and the late incomparable penciler, Jack Kirby. The technologically advanced Afro-futurist nation whose isolation from the world allows the dream of what many Africans across the diaspora often ask themselves. What could have been? Maybe those two comic book geniuses looked at the state of the Western world in the 1960s and also thought, what if white supremacy never touched the continent of Africa? As the trailer begins, CIA operative Everett K. Ross, played by Martin Freeman, alludes to Thor seeing a god fly, Iron Man, unimaginable weaponry, and the alien invasion of the first Avengers movie. But we still, after all this time, will now be introduced to something that we've never before seen in the MCU. Director Ryan Coogler will be our guide, and the actor slated to bring this fantasy to life shall be our light. For on February 16th of 2017, the children of Melanin will all have a chance to be Wakandans. You are now listening to another Stay Woke podcast. I'm your guide, Benjamin Owakari Unanowo, senior editor and content curator for thesonicbreakdown.com. Welcome to the Woke Condon Report a miniseries designed to unpack, analyze, and delve into the implications of the Black Panther MCVU debut film. Today we'll be focusing on the country of Wakanda, its history, applications in the Marvel world, and implications of a nation like this existing in our real world. I'm really excited to get a chance to go ahead and do this today. Uh, me, myself, I am Nigerian, and I've always been a fan of comic books. So when I got a chance to finally be introduced to the Black Panther, which I was introduced to the Panther through the series that started in the 1990s with Priest, a black comic book writer, he had re-envisioned the story of the Black Panther and had put a modern twist on it. But then my love of history allowed me to go back and take a look at the character and really figure it out. So Black Panther initially started out as a character, a part of the Jungle Action comic series, uh, before it finally initially, the character debuted in the Marvel Universe in the Fantastic Four. But for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to really just kind of more so focus on the MCU and the Black Panther coming into the Marvel films. So we first were introduced to T'Challa, the Black Panther, in Captain America Civil War. Initially, we see he and his father, they're meeting at the UN. If we remember from Captain America Civil War, there was this scene where we saw destruction on the continent of Africa where there were these weapons used, vibranium weapons, uh, that caused a lot of destruction. So his father, T'Chaka, decided to go there and talk in front of the UN to apologize and also start bringing Wakanda into the fold. Wakanda is actually an isolationist nation. If you go ahead and you take a look at Wakanda, it's a highly scientific and advanced nation uh, with technology that surpasses anything else that can be seen on Earth. And this initially started because of the fact that they have a metal that is unbreakable and highly valuable that is known as vibranium. 
Vibranium had been around inside of Marvel even before Adamantium and Wolverine's claws. So it's a very precious metal. Metal that's also found inside of Captain America's shield. So let's first go ahead and delve into the location of Wakanda. Wakanda is located in northeastern Africa. Its exact location can be varied throughout the nations. Um, it's roughly basically in East Africa. It's just north of Tanzania. Um, and it would probably be located in what we know as Lake Victoria. So, Wakanda is an isolationist nation, and it's been able to go ahead and thrive. Technologically, scientifically, it is more advanced than any other nation that exists within inside of the world. So how could this be? How did this African nation rise so quickly and so powerfully? Well, it's because they happen to have vibranium. Vibranium in the MCU is basically like what oil is to the Middle East. So, vibranium, what is it? It's a sound-absorbing mineral and metal that is located nowhere else in the world. It basically showed up due to a meteorite that crashed, and it was unearthed by T'Challa's great-great-great-grandparents, um, and it was initial character called Bashenga that only appears like in the Black Panther volume one. And he goes ahead and cultivates it. And they now have this metal, this precious metal that is used to go ahead and shape weapons as well as it infuses itself in the soil and it creates this heart shaped herb. So the heart shaped herb is actually how the Black Panther gets his extra powers. So this heart-shaped herb basically is a power structure that works from a standpoint of imagine closing your eyes and walking. Now, you probably know maybe the layout of your home, so you're not going to go ahead and bump into anything. But imagine having an innate ability kinetically to just know where everything's going to be. So that's kind of how the heart-shaped herb works. It increases all of the senses. It's basically the natural holistic version of Captain America's super soldier serum. So that's the type of power that the Black Panther is working with. And as a result, Wakanda having a chieftain and having a king like T'Chaka and T'Challa and their ancestor before them was allowed them to go ahead and remain a great warrior nation. So we basically start out at Captain America Civil War. And in Captain America Civil War, we go ahead and we're introduced to T'Chaka and T'Challa that are on their way to the UN and are there to go ahead. And Wakanda's getting ready to reveal themselves a little bit more to the world. Uh, they feel some sense of anguish and despair because their weapons had been stolen. Vibranium weapons were stolen. and horrific acts and atrocities were committed with their weapons, and they feel some type of way about it. Unfortunately, T'Chaka is murdered by, we think, Bucky Barnes inside of the movie, Captain America's dear friend and an assassin known as the Winter Soldier, and then that brings T'Challa into action and reveals himself to go ahead and be the Black Panther. Now, at the end of the movie, in the uh, Captain America Civil War. So, you know, it's spoilers, but look, if you listen to this podcast, you probably already should have gone ahead and watched that movie. If you haven't, you need to ASAP. So, at the end, Baron Von Zemo, who happens to be another villain, is revealed to be the person that actually murdered uh, T'Chaka. So T'Challa figures this out, spares his life, then goes ahead and takes Bucky Barnes in this fugitive of the world and mainly also of America and S.H.I.E.L.D. is now housed in Wakanda. And as Steve Rogers, Captain America, is sitting back and talking with T'Challa, he's just basically asking him, well, what's going to happen? You're harboring a, f a fugitive. They're going to come for him. And at the very end of that movie, T'Challa, in just a badass way, just says, well, then let them come. And the camera peers out and we see this huge panther statue among the mists and we see a bit of this afrofuturism that exists where we see the old mixed in with the new and it's just this utopian nation it looks like that is just nestled away perfectly 
And as we could see, that's where the strength lies for this nation, Wakanda, is in its isolation. So one thing that's very interesting about Wakanda is the technology. Due to the isolation, Wakanda technology has developed and it's developed to the point where they aren't afraid of anyone. Their defenses have allowed them throughout time to go ahead and stave off any and all invasions. But if you've gone ahead and you've watched the trailer, which I recommend you go ahead and watch the trailer, there's two out. In the initial trailer, we are met with Everett K. Ross, who happens to go ahead and be the liaison for America and S.H.I.E.L.D., and he is sitting across from a character that we are first introduced to in uh, the Ultron movie uh, that happens to be known as Ulysses S. Claw, a uh, former Dutch uh, Nazi type character who has constantly tried to go ahead and meddle in the affairs of Wakanda. He is the one that is responsible for those weapons being stolen and leading to the deaths of folks on the continent of Africa. So as a result, uh, we've seen his character try to meddle in multiple occasions inside of Wakandan politics. All right, so being a Nigerian and with Nigeria being the uh, source of conflict that led Wakanda to decide to go ahead and come out into the open world, what if I told you that T'Chaka, king of Wakanda, with all of his intim- or with all of his wisdom, basically ended up getting killed over jollof rice? Now, hear me out now. Nigeria was ravaged with these vibranium weapons. Obviously, T'Chaka has brought in the best and brightest from all over the world to come into Wakanda from time to time secretly and be able to give his people the resources that they need to study and then sending them out. So he clearly, clearly loves Jalof. He's African. And if you love Jalof, you know that you love Niger Jalof. So the reason why he decided to go out to the UN is because in my humble opinion, he knew that the cooks that he has in Wakanda that are Nigerian, they were on their way out of the country. And he had to go ahead and keep them there because Wakandans would have revolted without Niger Jalof. So as a result, he died over Jalof. He went out there to the UN council to go ahead and apologize to the nation of Nigeria and unfortunately was murdered. But we want to thank you, T'Chaka, for keeping your people fed off of proper jollof rice. So T'Challa, Father T'Chaka, is the person that really starts the industrialization of Wakanda. Basically, he realizes that this resource is something that people are going to want to be able to manipulate and be able to take and steal, which we've seen constantly on the continent of Africa, whether it be diamonds in Sierra Leone or the diamonds that exist in South Africa, oil that we even see now today in modern Nigeria and in Ghana, um, just all of the resources. Africa has always been a place to pillage and destroy from the outside world, specifically the Western world. And white supremacy has shaped the narrative of the continent. So T'Chaka, in his infinite wisdom, decides to go ahead and use technology to shield and shroud his people away from everything that's going on around them. As a result, he decides to go ahead and basically pick up the pace with their modernization by selling off small bits of the vibranium metal. So that's why the U.S. got one small little portion that, weirdly enough, went into a metal frisbee for Captain America. I mean, like, so you get this small piece of vibranium, and all you decide to use it for is, hey, we got this dude that's awesome, and he's going to be our top-level fighter, and we're going to give him a shield. So, I mean, there were probably plenty of other things that could have been done, but that's what the U.S. chose to do. So with the money that T'Chaka would get from selling off the small pieces, he actually reinvested back with inside of his people, 
he would go ahead and use that to go ahead and buy infrastructure and fix it and build it up, as well as send off the best and brightest members of Wakanda to universities all across the world. So it's very similar in a way to if we look historically. The Romans, the Greeks, all of the Western civilization were taught by Moors or were taught by Egyptians, taught with inside of Mali and inside of the great libraries of Timbuktu. They sent their best and brightest to be taught by Africans. So in this fictional story and in this fictional realm, we see how T'Chaka went ahead and used that same type of uh, way of being able to go ahead and build his people up by sending them off. So he sent them off, but they came back. And when they came back, they utilized the technology that they were able to go ahead and use out in the Western world and the ability of, uh, you know, intellectual freedom to go ahead and craft new materials, new weapons, new medicines there with inside of Wakanda that really allowed it to advance as a nation. So in order to go ahead and properly talk about a people, you have to talk about a people's belief systems. So. There happened to go ahead and be multiple belief systems with inside of Wakanda. Just like naturally here in our world, we as African Americans and Africans within the diaspora are not a monolithic people. There's a multitude of different beliefs that we have, and that's what allows us to be a creative people. So when it comes to the Wakandans, you happen to have the panther cult, the white gorilla cult, the lion cult, and the crocodile cult. Now, don't be alarmed. When I'm talking about cults here, I'm not talking about witchcraft. We're talking about these different groups that exist, that have their own practices and beliefs. And in fact, that's how the Black Panther becomes the Black Panther. So let's go over each cult a little bit here, and then we'll go ahead and draw some analogies to the real world. First, there happens to go ahead and be the panther cult. So initially talked about Bass is the panther goddess. And Bass is an ancient Egyptian deity who happens to be the primary deity of Wakanda. So Wakanda, when it comes to their belief structures, the panther cult is the dominant cult among all of the other cults. Uh, T'Challa's ancestor, Bashanga, became the first Black Panther and closed the Vibranium Mountain to outsiders, forming a religious order that guarded the mound and fought to keep the demon spirits from spreading across the kingdom. The Black Panther is a ceremonial and religious title that's given to the chief of the Panther tribe. So that is the mantle that exists when you go ahead and don and take on the Black Panther. As part of the cult ceremonies, a chosen Black Panther is entitled to the use of the heart-shaped herb. The herb enhances the physical attributes of the person who consumes it to near superhuman levels. So basically, it happens to go ahead and be that super serum soldier in a way that Steve Rogers, Captain America has. So T'Challa, very similar to, say, Kunta Kente, goes through a rites and passage type of system to where he has to constantly go through these tests to see whether or not he has the ability to finally meet up with the panther goddess and be chosen either in a yes or no situation. It's very similar also to, say, the Divine Nine, which happens to be the black Greek organizations that have existed here in the United States of America for quite some time. So the panther cult similar to those type of organizations to where people go through a process of what they call pledging which has been outlawed now, but in the past there was pledging and it was above ground and it was a system that was used to go ahead and strip down individuals and then remake them with inside the image of the organization and to go ahead and cross their burning sands, so to speak, in order to go ahead and come out new on the other side. And we saw that a little bit in the movie Roots with Kunta Kente going through all of the trials in order to go ahead and become a hunter. You know, we saw him out there racing OJ uh, as OJ was uh, taking him down because he needed to go ahead and steal something as one of his um, trials. Well, he really wasn't supposed to go ahead and steal it, but that's how he thought best to go ahead and do it. So that's one way of looking at it. Then we happen to have the white gorilla cult. 
Uh, Greki, the gorilla god, is an ancient Wakandan deity. Wakanda evolved from a hunter-warrior society and was traditionally ruled by its greatest warrior. The dominant Black Panther cult outlawed the rival white gorilla cult's worship in Wakanda. So, if you're watching the trailer, there happens to be a scene in there, if you freeze it, to where you can see two figures in water surrounded by other warriors and it looks like there happens to be a fight going on. Most likely the person that are in that's in the scene is T'Challa because he's wearing a panther mask and then the person opposite him in the background happens to have on a gorilla mask. That is most likely one of the villains of the Black Panther, M'Baku. M'Baku is the leader of the white gorilla cult. So he is the Black Panther to his cult. Um M'Baku is a person that is a might make right type of individual. So earlier, if we were talking about it being similar to the Greek nine, uh, divine nine of the Greeks, then we could basically say that M'Baku happens to be the Omega Psi Phi version. He uh, is a strong individual that is headstrong, that is ready to go ahead and lead, but he just happens to go ahead and be a part of the cult that is not in charge. So he, at times, is trying to go ahead and thwart T'Challa, not really in a negative way, but just in the way of these two cults are constantly competing against one another. So for the trial of M'Baku, one of the things that the white gorilla cult has to do is they have to go find a white gorilla living in the jungle, and they have to go ahead and slay it, then eat its flesh. And the white gorillas tend to go ahead and have their own magical powers, most likely due to vibranium. They probably themselves are either eating the uh, heart-shaped herbs or something else that happens to have vibranium infused inside of it, which gives great strength. And that's why M'Baku is such a dangerous villain and a dangerous challenger to T'Challa because of the strength that he has from the white gorilla cult. Then moving on, we happen to have the Lion Goddess. This is a deity that relies upon speed uh, and has a number of powers uh, and grows within size and can also teleport themselves. There isn't a lot really known about the Lion Goddess or the cults uh, or this cult in particular. Uh, there aren't too many characters that pop up with inside of the comic books. So it'd be interesting to see in the MCU if they're going to go ahead and talk about the lion cult at all. And then also there happens to be the crocodile cult, which is pretty much the oldest deity uh, cult along with Basque for the panther goddess. However, once again, there's not really a lot of stuff known about the crocodile cult at all. So with inside of Wakanda, you have belief structures that exist. You have these trials and you have the elites and the elites all tend to go ahead and be a part of one of these cults. And then you have them kind of have a little bit of friction back and forth against each other, which is no different than what we see with modern day religion here across the world. Or as I was saying, we see on a lower scale when it comes to Greek organizations. So this is how the people of Wakanda utilize their religion and utilize their belief structures from a more bourgeoisie standpoint, because not everyone is allowed to go ahead and be with inside of these cults. So let's take a look at Wakanda from a realism standpoint. What would a nation like Wakanda look like if it just existed here in our real realm? Um, it'd be very interesting. One, if Iraq and Iran and all of these other nations had basically been meddled with by Western powers over oil, you better believe that at the end of World War II, uh, finding out about vibranium and talking about things like democracy, Western nations, including the United States of America, would deem Wakanda probably as a threat, an enemy, and look to try to find a way to subvert and remove T'Chaka and then now T'Challa from being in power of the country. And that brings up a great question of if Wakanda has so many weapons and is so powerful, why on earth would they allow their neighboring countries to be under colonial rule? And that's where the rub lies 
is the fact that their isolation is the only thing that has kept them around and allowed them to survive. All other nations surrounding them on the continent of Africa would literally be proxy countries uh, that would be involved in trying to go ahead and depose any type of leaders that existed in Wakanda and tried to go ahead and topple the government. We saw this with uh, the Congo and Patrice Lumumba. We've seen this throughout multiple issues with inside of Africa and colonialism. So if we look at it in today's world, um, China, China is a superpower. Uh, they would probably try to go ahead and hack into Wakanda. But that's an interesting thing. One thing about Wakanda is their technology is completely sound. Uh, they have some of the best computer programmers. They utilize uh, Vibranium. They also utilize what seems like a little bit of mysticism with inside of their technology. Some of this was on display if you had the privilege or if you have the opportunity maybe of going on YouTube and watching the Black Panther series that was done on BET. Uh, it's a comic uh, type of uh, series. I think it's about six episodes. It was awesome. The soundtrack was great. The voice acting. And there's a scene in there where someone's trying to go ahead and hack into the mainframe of Wakanda and T'Challa is like literally in there as if it's like the matrix so like his physical being is over here hacking away like with his own fingers trying to keep people out of the defense systems of wakanda but at the same time when they're breaking through the firewalls then it's like the mysticism of the panther god and wakanda are in there uh, and um, t'challa are in there and they're battling against the hackers so I mean, the intelligence and the technology is just something that's never been seen before. So a country like China would have a huge problem trying to go ahead and hack into Wakanda. I would say the same thing for Russia. The main issue would probably be the United States of America. And that's what we're seeing in the movie with the character Everett K. Ross. Uh, we also saw it inside of the six-part series I was talking about on BET, where it's really funny. They have this round table going on with a general that's voiced by Stan Lee. Uh, and we have a character there that clearly seems like she's Condoleezza Rice. And Everett K. Ross's character is there. And he's talking about Wakanda. And the general, of course, is just spewing out all of this racist type of rhetoric where he's like, how can a bunch of, you know, people with spears and stuff be so technologically advanced? Like, why don't we just go in there and just take the country over? It's like, all you need to do is just give me a few men and I could take care of it. And Everett K. Ross, who's the liaison and basically historian for Wakanda, is just like, look, we've already tried. It's not going to happen. He's like, oh, we'll send in Captain America, send in the best. And he's like, we already sent in the best because you actually get a chance to see a flashback to where Captain America shows up during World War II where Nazis, led by the villain of this movie, Ulysses S. Claw, are attempting to go ahead and try to get into Wakanda and most likely steal Vibranium. So, in order to go ahead and stop them, uh, the Captain America shows up and he's trying to go ahead and get there first and be um, basically a, uh, I guess, bearer of goodwill on the United States part. And when he gets there, he already sees a bunch of heads on spikes. And he's like, what's going on? And then he sees the Black Panther. And the Black Panther tells him, you know, thank you. It's nice to meet you, Steve Rogers, but you need to go ahead and leave my country. And of course, being the dutiful soldier boy that he is, the uh, Steve Rogers decides to go ahead and push back a little bit. It's just like, hey, you need my help. And T'Chaka tells him, look, I'm going to give you like to like the count of three. You need to roll, player. But he decides to go ahead and press on. Well, a fight ensues and all that happens is Captain America doesn't end up getting into Wakanda and he ends up rolling back with a black eye and his feelings hurt. So that's the level of protection that the chieftain and king of Wakanda, the Black Panther, gives towards his people, as well as the level of defense that exists there. So, when we're looking at Wakanda in this world, yes, they would be extremely selfish. Uh, would most likely any country that was neighboring them would economically be in shambles. Um, 
and of course will constantly probably have their governments toppled by Western powers and by superpowers like China in order to try to topple their government. So in a way, Wakanda is a dream and it's a beautiful dream to have, but it just couldn't work in a realistic sense within our world. Because as much as we're rooting for them, there would probably be resentment here in the United States of America. There's already a resentment that exists between African Americans and Africans in terms of respect. There is not, uh, we've been constantly been bombarded recently with articles that talk about, is it cultural appropriation for African Americans wearing traditional African garb? We hear from the African standpoint of, you know, there is a disrespect towards our culture and the way that, you know, we speak and people talking about growing up in America and being labeled and called African booty scratchers. And then you happen to have on the other side, you hear African-Americans talking about the disrespect that they receive from Africans and being called words like Akata and just a whole misunderstanding of sorts uh, that has been promoted primarily by self-hate and by white supremacy. And I think that would only be exacerbated if you were to have the struggles that are going on here currently in America. Like, what would T'Challa's viewpoint be on the death of Trayvon Martin, the death of Freddie Gray, the death of Sandra Bland? Like, how could African Americans here hold Wakanda up to a high standard and root for T'Challa and his nation if they were to see the diaspora of black folks here in the United States of America going through that suffering and not getting up uh, with inside of the UN uh, council and saying something about it, not bringing up the U S on charges for the atrocities that they are committing against a people that they share a connective link to. So that would be, I think very interesting at the same time too. Wakanda does exist in East Africa. So there probably wouldn't be really many African Americans that could trace any of their lineage to Wakanda due to the fact that it is an isolationist nation. And the only people that they've sent out there have been by design in order to then come back and be able to build up their community. But on a flip side, maybe with the way things are going, we see in cities like Detroit and Philadelphia and Cleveland, we see foreign nationals coming in, Chinese, Greeks, Russians, and they're buying up property and they're rebuilding these downtowns and revitalizing them uh, because they see the culture and more importantly, the dollar signs that these predominantly African-American cities can deliver upon. So maybe you would see Wakanda going into Detroit and buying off blocks and redeveloping the cities as you saw uh, that you see inside of Harlem. Like maybe they would come in with their educational system. Like just think about a teach for America type of structure that was designed on a teach for Wakanda type of system to where they're sending their best and their brightest to school. But right before they come back to Wakanda in order to go ahead and keep the tradition and keep the power structure intact of their nation that maybe they spent a two to five year type period similar like the Peace Corps to where they are going ahead and helping out the black youths within inside of the inner city and helping develop them educationally, developing them from a business standpoint and allowing them to go ahead and be the agents and authors of their own recovery. That would be a beautiful thing to go ahead and see. But I just have a feeling that it's not something that would happen. But maybe as we're starting to see with T'Challa inside of the MCU, he seems to be a bit more of an integration uh, integrationist than his father was and the prior kings before him. But I think that's also where we'll eventually see the problems that stem from him and the character played by Michael B. Jordan. Eric Killamon, uh, which he seems to be much more of a separatist with inside the mold of a 
Booker T. Washington with inside of the mold of a Marcus Garvey that doesn't want to go ahead and open up his borders and then ultimately see his people crumble from within. So when we're discussing Wakanda, it's fun, but it's also in a way a sad thing because we just don't know what would happen if it existed with inside of this real, you know, reality that we're faced with. So when we go over the question of, you know, what will Wakanda look like in a realistic sense? Um, all we have to do is kind of look to history, like looking at world history. When the French and English came across the Zulu tribe during their expansion period, they couldn't stand the Zulus beating them with spears and shields and tactics that they just couldn't accept from savages. So what followed was loss after loss and, you know, an exaggerated excuse for the losing. Um, and Wakanda would have been forced to destroy countries like Germany, um, who would not stand for inferiors existing that they couldn't control them. So when you look at it, if Wakanda existed as a nation around the time of like World War II, um, they possibly would probably run multiple areas. I would just see an expansion of the country because when you have that level of militaristic power, um, there's no way that you would just solely want to go ahead and be defensive. At certain point in time, you would just have to say, we must eradicate our um, oppressors. We must eradicate those that seek to constantly destroy us. Um, and as a result, because they happen to be an African nation where there aren't any allies, you probably wouldn't see a situation like what you see right now with the nation of Israel and their alliance with the United States of America. I mean, when the Seven Days War happened between Arab nations and Israel, they could have continued to advance upon those nations and wipe them out if it was not for basically uh, the UN of European nations and the United States just saying, whoa, let's just let, let's stop here. OK, you know, like you you've proved your point. Like, we understand that there are nations and people that want to wipe you off of the map, but you have to do things within reason. But who would Wakanda's ally be? I doubt it would be the United States of America. I doubt it would be France or Germany or the UK. So as a result, they would probably have to take a standpoint to where they would need to control Places They would have to control the Mediterranean. They would have to go ahead and control ports uh, through the Indian Ocean just to maintain and make sure that they could sustain themselves. They would need to create basically a buffer zone so I could see them going in and invading a Kenya, invading an Egypt, uh, invading an Ethiopia, not for the choice of subjugating those people, but more so to create more of a buffer between them and the people that seek to destroy them. So as a result, Wakanda would probably be considered to be warmongers amongst the rest of the African nations um, that would probably be asking for help from the UN to go ahead and stop these guys. So um, you would basically have a World War III on your hands if you were dealing with Wakanda. So that's what it would be, World War Three. But bringing us back to the beginning, Wakanda, it's a great time to go ahead and be alive as a person that's a part of the diaspora. And I can't wait until February 16th for us to get a chance to then talk about what we've watched and to be able to decipher it and hopefully move forward. So it makes me think of how great is this soundtrack possibly going to be? And I'm really hoping that artists, rapper, Sci High the Prince's uh, track New Africa, if you haven't heard it, you need to. I'd really hope that his track New Africa finds its way on the soundtrack. And I just want to go ahead and leave us by reciting the poem 
by Ernestine Johnson that is read on the interlude leaving the song where she states, she's the birthplace of all life where the sons of Abraham found wives, the Bathshebas, the Esthers, the Eves. Imagine queens who went to Spelman swimming in the Red Sea, backstroking in two-piece bikinis off the strength of their degrees, bodies handcrafted by fingerprints of God with the brains to match. Ain't no self-hate, ain't no slave trade, ain't no niggas to catch, gold flowing through our veins like water flowing through the Nile, walking through Jerusalem in Yeezy booths before the exile. Imagine August Wilson sitting on the same throne as Mansa Musa did, writing stories of empowerment and self-righteous for our kids. Imagine how we all suddenly come to our senses. Ain't no dick riding, ain't no marginalization, ain't no riding fences, beaches filled with blue skies and white sand. We'd all have money in stock, all own a piece of the rock, a piece of the land, as the original people unified we all stand. Imagine a place with all the creators of all the new waves stood in one space i'm talking touch tone phones pressing combs and potato chips box them bitches up and sell them to other nations and send them off in slave ships new africa this is benjamin owakari unanowo editor and content curator for the sonic breakdown.com i just want to thank you for tuning in to another great episode on the stay woke podcast this is one of the first parts of the series that we are doing Woke Conda, the Woke Condon Report. Thank you so much for having us. And just remember, if you don't stay woke, at least try to be woke. And this is me signing off. Mm-hmm.